thing that's very effective in this book that you use is the use of the personal stories uh, to tell that to get this these points across, and that you uh, that you found these people uh, who had had some barriers or uh, obstacles that they had faced. What, what made you think about going that way, and, and how did you how did you find those people? Going that way is something you know. There's a, as my mother used to say, um, there's a time and a place for for everything. And I've had it on my mind for five or six or seven years. I couldn't see how to do it. I mean, it, it was sort of out there. So I wrote the book in 2011 or 12, whatever it was, called Harnessing America's Wasted Talent, the New Ecology of Learning. Very arm's length, data-driven, you know, uh, much more objective uh, kind of. Uh, and then I wrote the, the last one. But the notion somehow I felt ready about two years ago, I had been blogging and I had blogged myself to a point where I was talking about when, when just practices become best practices. In other words, we always think about best practices as these things we do. And I was began to be really taken with the notion that it's how we do them and the respect that we bring for different backgrounds and different kinds of knowledge and, and different behaviors. and and frankly, different abilities. And you know, how many kids with ADHD, despite all our best efforts, just never have a chance because they can't remember the algebra equation. They need to remember, not to mention, is algebra really necessary for 80% of the people who go to high school? That's a different issue. Then you say, well, so how does a guy like me meet all these people? And what I did, which uh, I suppose if it were this isn't research, so I didn't have to satisfy a bunch of scholars as to... I, I called about 15 friends. So I talked to uh, uh, Wendy Copeland at uh, Goodwill. And I you okay. know, talked to people that we had worked with at UMGC. And then I talked to other educators, uh, Dennis Litke at College Unbound, which is an amazing new program, just wonderful, cool program. And I just began to collect people uh, and then I would write them, and you know, and I probably got 30 or 40 names, and some people said thanks, but no thanks, because you know, I said, you're going to edit this. I mean, I'm not going to write a thing that you don't agree to, but I really want to get your life story. And reasonable people can say, gee, you know, that's fine, but I'm not sure I want to share my life story <laughs> in a large. So you know, it, and it ended up we started, I think, with 24, and by the, a couple of people then said no thank you and we sure. ended up with, with 20. I realized it was very random in the sense that I was looking for people who were willing and I would then talk to them and ask them and say, you know, tell, tell me a little bit, you know, give me the 15 minute version of your, your story. The, the stories were all, every one of them were different, but every one of them had similar strands of sure. reality. And so I just sort of walked into it and my experience, I mean, we were assessing prior learning at the Community College of Vermont in 1971, 72, and 73. Oh, good for you. When Kale was beginning, and they, I was on the original board at Kale, we were just doing it. We, there were no standards. We just were trying to do it. I've known, you know, you can have very different life patterns in parts of the country, but the fact is, even if each story is different one way or the other, there are common themes throughout. And so I wasn't where it wasn't a research project. I was looking for real people with real stories that could make the case about uh, our untapped account. And in this case, getting tapped and what it takes um, and how hard it was for them. And so I sort of followed my nose and ended up with 20, uh, 20 good people and who were courageous enough to tell their stories. In, in talking here, it's probably not lost to, on people who are uh, uh, watching this uh, or listening to this, and it's not lost on us that here we are, you know, two old white guys talking about some of these <laughs> some of these issues. And then one of the ways that you kind of came to grips with that was that one of the people you interviewed or, or talk about is yourself and your background. Could you say a little bit about how how that fits into the book and in your your thinking? Well, you know it. It was a really, um, I think it was a very important moment for me. As I said, this is a real learning journey. And about two thirds of the way through, maybe 
eight or nine, nine, ten months ago, I hit the wall. And I said, and what I said was to myself, oh my God, what right do I have to be writing this book? Um, I am an icon of white male privilege in a racist, I believe, uh, society. Um, whether we like it or not, whether we're trying to change it or not, it's there. And I actually went to my wife uh, and said, I got a big problem. I don't know how to deal with this. And she looked out the window and thought about it for a minute. And she said, interview yourself. You're the counterpoint. Your, your, your story is what is it like, or one of the ways it's like, when the road is paved, when you get the benefit of the doubt, when people pick you up when you fall down, where you get to choose your battles. And you know, one of my points in the book, as you know, is I've lost some doozy battles in my life. I lost to the NRA when I was in Congress and it cost me my seat. But I picked that fight. I chose it. And one of the commonalities of these people is that they're losing fights every day they never asked for. So I thought, okay. And so I interviewed myself. And that's the first chapter or section of one of the books called My Story. Whether I can say this because I'm getting older or I could have been as good about this, but it was hilarious to actually look at my life uh. through that lens. And the story I tell, there are many stories I tell to make the point. Because the thing in this whole book and all the stories is I wanted to get past the data. We all know the data, but there are real people behind this data who are living lives. And so I'm in the ninth grade at Burlington Junior High School in Burlington, Vermont, and I'm flunking algebra. Uh, it turned out 50 years later that I uh, had serious ADHD. And it took me another 45 years to figure that out. And my father's solution um, was to repeat the ninth grade the next year at Phillips Academy Andover, uh, one of the better prep, or some think the best prep school in America. Very well, exclusive a, place, yes, yes. Yeah, that's a pretty good fix, you know? I mean, <laughs> and, and it saved my butt because I then graduated and four years later, I went to Princeton and I graduated magna cum laude. And then two years after that, I started a college. As unlikely as that all is, none of it would have happened if my father had not had the means and the connections to bail me out and send me to end up. As you, when I left the Congress, I had five short-term and then longer-term job offers. Just like, they're just, the stories of when the road is paved and there are little off-ramps, you're having a hard time, you can take, take a time out and life is still there for you when you come back. And so it was really interesting for me to understand what my privilege meant to me in ways that I had been generally aware of but hadn't really investigated. And to compare that with what it's like when none of those things are ready or apparent. And then what was really interesting in each of the stories in different ways, those things begin to happen. You make a friend, whether it's in prison or in your daily life, who helps you gives you good advice, or somebody says, don't ever do that again, uh, somebody you love, and you like your daughter in one case, and you say, oh, God, okay, I won't, which was go back to jail. Um, sure. And But there are transitions and turning points, and then people who advise you and then network you to the opportunity that you get and give all your natural talents a chance to exhibit themselves in a way uh, that you couldn't before. The connection between the two is, one's a paved road and the other's at best a pathway through the woods or a pothole dirt road. But the keys to success, along with your natural intelligence and talent, the key to success is getting the benefit of the doubt, finding a friend who will advise you with good advice, networking to opportunity you might not find otherwise. And somehow we've got to we've got to democratize that, you know right. that we've got to make that not something that's available to me and my children and grandchildren. It's available to everyone. Yeah, I always talk about that. That you mentioned about I always talk about being lucky that they had you know someone or some experience that helped them to turn.